I'm Ray Mears. My job is keeping people alive in the wilderness. Welcome to Extreme Survival. Alaska has always been a place where survival is the name of the game, as the passengers and crew of the Fowland discovered when they were stranded for a month in the depths of winter and their ship frozen in history. It's a place where a little knowledge can save your life in summer or winter, and no one ever takes anything for granted. The world may be getting smaller, but there are still plenty of wild places where you can come and enjoy yourself. Mind you, they're the sort of places where if you make one mistake, you can end up miles from help, having to make life or death decisions. We're in Alaska, the largest state in America, and one of the last great wildernesses. Perched in the northwest corner of the states, Alaska stretches far into the Arctic Circle and has weather to match. Even in summer, it never really warms up, and in winter, temperatures can plummet to 40 degrees below freezing. Alaska is staggering. It's much bigger than Britain, France, and Germany combined, and yet has a population of just 600,000 people. That's about one person per square mile. So it's not surprising that people get into difficulties out here on a fairly regular basis like the passengers and crew of the Farallon, wrecked on a reef and transformed into a ghostly iceberg. Incredibly, they survived a month before rescue. And the dog musher, lost for over a week in the freezing wilderness. It's the space that attracts people, the idea of getting away from it all. There's nothing better than exploring on your own terms, far from the tourist trail, and in summer, it can be light 24 hours a day. It really is fabulous. Alaskans have their own way of getting around. They use float planes like we use cars, but it's all too easy to get into trouble, as airline engineer Mike Legler found out when he set off beachcombing one summer's day. Children were at school and my wife was at work. It was my day off. They had no idea I was even going flying that day. He'd already been to one lake, but it was such a beautiful day, he thought he'd keep going. But on the next lake, he misjudged his landing. I didn't file a flight plan. I ventured out way too far and ended up about 250 miles from my home. Made a descending left turn due to the steepness of the mountains on the side of the lake. The reflection back into the water uh, gave me sort of a vertigo disorientation. I must have been six inches above the water. The front of the left float caught the water. There was a loud crash, bang. And that's all I remember until I woke up in the airplane, submerged. I was confused because I still had one hand on the yoke and one hand on the throttle like I was flying. And I couldn't see out of my right eye. And I put my hand up to my eye and pulled away, it was all blood. The door opened and I swam out under the wing up to the surface and started to swim away from the airplane. And as I did, the engine weight pulled the nose down, the tail went up and there was just an eerie wisp as it just below the surface and was gone. And then I realized how far I had to swim. When I got out of the water, I was so weak from the cold I could barely walk. I could walk 10 or 20 feet, fall, get up, walk some more. And I remember shivering so bad that I couldn't control my actions. I found a rather large driftwood log to get behind out of the breeze, and I started a fire. It was very difficult to light a fire. The driftwood was wet, and it, nothing would burn. And I would get just a little bit of a smolder, and I would blow on it, and the blood dripping from my head would put the fire out. I had a handkerchief and I took the shoelace out of my left tennis shoe and tied the shoelace around my head to hold it in place 
and uh, it seemed to stop the bleeding. In my survival vest, I had a small package of cigars. They were soaked and wet, and I pulled the cellophane off the package and flicked off the water and put it underneath, and it lit instantly, and then slowly added larger and larger pieces of kindling until it was a, a good-sized fire. Mike's next action probably saved his life. He decided to take his soaking clothes off and dry them by the fire. You lose heat 25 times faster when you're wet than when you're dry. But even so, many people in the same circumstances probably wouldn't take theirs off. I wrung out the excess water and placed them over the log to get the heat from the fire. Dried my clothes while I continued to watch for boats or airplanes. Nothing came all that afternoon or that evening till dark. And I knew I had to stay by that fire that way I survived the night at least, and I got semi-dried off. But I don't remember sleeping much that night. When there were no boats out there the next morning, it occurred to me that I might stay there, end up there a long time. So I decided that uh, if I was gonna survive, I needed to walk out of there. And I got approximately five miles, and I had to climb over about a 200-foot steep side of the hill. And it occurred to me that if I took a fall there and broke an ankle or a leg or an arm, I'd be in even more trouble than I was already in. So I turned around and I walked back to the beach where I was. I remember sitting on the log and thinking over my options. And uh, I didn't see that I had any options. And uh, what depressed me a lot was uh, I knew what my family would be getting to go through and I really felt like a fool for putting them through this. As I was sitting there, I remember turning around looking at the woods behind me, and something didn't look right. I realized that but somebody had cut some trees down. I got up and I walked back into the woods, and as I started down this little overgrown trail, there was a plywood shack cabin. And I ran down to this thing. And I found a bag of moldy peanuts, some tools, some nails, and some dirty brown rolled up carpet on the floor. And I remember thinking, now my options have changed. I knew I could stay there for quite a length of time. I'd assumed with the carpet that was in there, I could make sort of a sleeping bag pouch and I could possibly get warm that night. And I remember climbing in the sleeping bag and uh, actually felt semi-warm for the first time in a day and a half. I had hope then that tomorrow would be a better day. Something will come along. I was bored, so I spent the next uh, day and a half using the remaining carpet to make myself a hat and a vest to try and stay warm. It was something to pass the time to keep my mind occupied and keep me from going crazy. I made this hat and this vest. It wasn't very fashionable, but it, it did the job. And uh, at one point I thought of, uh, I wonder how they make sleeves. And I decided that was way too complicated. And then I found a small piece of rope to tie around it to hold it closed. But it kept the wind off and it did the job. What Mike was going through is common in many survival situations as he experienced a cocktail of powerful emotions. It was really odd. The mood would cycle from feeling really happy about little things that happened to uh, severe depression. Uh, I remember sitting there on that beach for hours at a time, just uh, depressed and uh, the thought of losing my airplane, that little airplane I had been all over the state and uh, knowing what my family was going through and uh, what a creep I'd been for doing that to them and uh, wondering about what my destiny was going to be out there. It was now over a week since Mike's crash. I was very depressed and very weak. I had assumed that I wasn't going to make it through the night. In the woods, I found a regular white paper plate, and I wrote out my last will. 
a note to my wife and to the kids. And I hung it inside that cabin on the wall so that when somebody found my bones sometime, they'd know who I was and who to get a message to. I can't remember what convinced me that uh, I wouldn't go on much longer. I climbed into my sleeping bag. It was shaking so bad that I couldn't fall asleep. I must have at some point. And this figure came through the wall. It looked like some kind of a large dog's head, just an image with a foaming mouth. And it knew my name, and it talked to me directly. And it said, um, are you cold enough yet, Mike? Are you hungry enough yet, Mike? I can get you out of here. And I said, I reject it. I said, I'll never turn my will over to you. And the figure went away, and it got semi-light in the cabin. I felt warm, I felt full, and I slept till 10 o'clock the next morning, slept like a baby. And the next two days, I was just kind of okay with everything. Whatever happened was gonna happen. I remember on the, the Wednesday of the next week, Mark, what a beautiful spot it was there. If I'd just come to visit, it would be even prettier, but being stranded there, it didn't seem that pretty. And there was a roar of an airplane. I remember running back up the trail just to watch an airplane disappearing across the bay, and I fired a flare and uh, saw the plane turn towards me and keep coming and keep coming, and pretty soon I saw the flaps coming down. So I knew he was gonna land. I knew he'd seen the flare. And I came crashing down through the brush line, and there was one guy with a rifle. And I opened my mouth and nothing came out. I kept hanging onto the tail of his airplane. And I remember he took the keys out of the ignition and he put them in my pocket. He said, sit down, I won't leave without you. And he asked me, where's your airplane? And I told him, it's in the bottom of the lake. He looked at me and said, you're the guy that's been missing for over a week? And I said, that's me. And uh, I hopped in the airplane and away we went. The call of the wild is hard to resist. And in summer, there are plenty of resources to be found if you know where to look. Here's a useful survival tip. All sedges are edible. So how do you tell a sedge like this one? Well, most of them, if you cut them through, are triangular in cross section like that. Now, you can't eat the green parts because they contain too much cellulose. It's the seeds that you go for. And these can be ground up and made into a rough flour and cooked on a hot rock. Even some of the most unlikely of resources were used, like these sort of hair lichens. This one could be used as an absorbent dressing for bleeding wounds, could be used like kitchen towel to wipe the slime off the outside of fish before cooking, and it can even be used for lighting fires. This really is one of the very best tinders. Now I'm going to make something simple but quite special, a fish hook. What I've collected are all bits of spruce. I've got here a couple of thin bits of dead spruce branch and some spruce roots. What I have to do first of all is tidy these spruce roots up so that I can use them as a binding material. And for that, I'm just going to prepare this thin stick by cutting the end so that it looks like a screwdriver. Now very carefully splitting it a few centimetres, like so, like that. Now, I call this tool a break. I'm gonna use this to remove the bark from these roots. Next job is to split this root in half. And I start that with the knife very carefully. I don't want to cut myself. And I now peel the two halves away from each other. Now it's quite difficult to keep the split running centrally down the root. There's a tendency 
for the split to want to run off to one side. Now if that happens, the thicker remaining side has to be bent back more severely to bring it true again. And this is the same technique that's employed for splitting any sort of wood. Now this piece of wood is going to make the shaft. So that's it, ready for the next stage, which is to fit a barb onto this hook. I'm going to use a bone from a halibut. I'll trim this up a little bit, and I'm gonna lash that into that position using the spruce root. I start by taking the end and placing it parallel to the barb. And now, I wrap around the shaft and the hook at the tail end and continue going in that fashion. There. Needs a few more minutes just to tidy it up, but that is it. A simple fish hook. In summer, the rivers here are full of salmon returning to spawn. They're all here, sockeye, silver, king, and I'll show you my favorite way to cook them. To cook my salmon, I'm gonna barbecue it or panace it. For that, I'm gonna use a couple of sticks. I've got a piece of alder here and an alder root I'm gonna use as some string. I need to split the alder to hold the salmon fillet over the fire. And I'll also be using these sticks later. I just need to quickly gut the fish, rinse it in the sea, and we're ready to start. So now to fillet the fish, first thing I want to do is to remove these fins here if I pull that down and get hold of it like a toggle so that I don't cut myself and slice around with the sawing action. Normally leave a bit of meat on here because all of these bits can be saved and used later to make a good soup. This dorsal fin here, that comes off too with a sawing action. Now turning my knife over, I come around behind the gills and that fin there, behind the head, and turn over and come back at that from the other side, like so. Now, what I've got to do is to take my thumb down to the spine and pinch the ribs and start to ease the ribs out from the flesh. And they come out beautifully, like that. There you go, just like Felix the cat has been here. There's the head, the tail, all the ribs and the spine and that can be saved to make a beautiful stock later on. Don't waste any part of the fish. Now just look through here for any little bones that may be left. There we go, beautiful steak, all ready for cooking and that's where the sticks are gonna come in useful. I'm going to use the sticks to hold the fish open in the cooking and to start with, I need to make six holes, three on each side, where the sticks will go. What I like to do is to actually put the sticks through to start with. It helps me get the right mark when I turn the fish over, the right point to place the next hole. Turn him over, and now I can see quite clearly why I need to make the next holes. Salmon skin's an extremely tough material. You can't just push the wood through easily. You need to cut the holes. In fact, wherever there are large salmon runs and indigenous people, salmon skin has been put to good use. 
For example, the Inuit used to tan it to make very tough waterproof gloves for kayaking and containers to hold food. There we go. And this is where the split stick comes in. I'm going to slip this stake down inside the split and then clamp it shut and that's going to hold the fish like a vice. And this is where I use the, the root to lash the whole thing shut for cooking. A lot of people use tin foil when they're cooking but I can't abide tin foil, it just litters up the wilderness, it never rots away. All these materials are going to return to nature and there it is ready for cooking. It only takes 30 minutes and the end result is delicious. Oh, look at that. It doesn't get much better than that. And it's not going to be dry, it's going to be beautifully moist. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm. I love Alaska. Everywhere you look, there's spectacular scenery and no sign that anyone has ever been here. It's a real land of adventure. On a day like today, it's a dream, but try this in winter. And you'll get a very different welcome. From October onwards, Alaska is lethal. There are places where almost 30 feet of snow fall each year, temperatures drop to minus 40 degrees, and up in the Arctic Circle, there's barely an hour of sunlight a day. Get caught out in these conditions, and you quickly realize how fragile human beings are. A hundred years ago, in the heart of winter, these waters saw the start of a tale of endurance and survival to rival any. We're heading out across Cook Inlet. That's one of the most treacherous stretches of water in the world. These seas have the second largest tidal range in North America, almost 30 feet, and that means currents of up to 10 knots and very unpredictable conditions. Even in today's world, full of digital technology and satellite communications, People are wary about setting out across these waters. A hundred years ago, this place was just as tough, but the equipment available was much more basic. Few ships even had radios back then, so any journey up this isolated coast was a perilous voyage indeed. That was the case when a remarkable tale of endurance and survival began in the teeth of an Alaskan winter, right here. This is Iliamna Bay. At high tide, it looks just like any other stretch of coast on Cook Inlet, barren and deserted. Low tide reveals wreckage strewn all along the coastline here. This is a lifeboat davit. And this is the capstan. These are all that remain of the steamship Farallon. On January the 5th, 1910, the ship crashed into the reef near here, marooning all 38 passengers and crew on this snowy shoreline. Conditions were so severe that the wreck soon became encrusted in ice. On shore, things were to get just as bad. In 1910, the Farallon was delivering mail up the coast from Seattle to Alaska. Steve Lloyd has spent years researching and writing the story of the Farallon. All I knew when I started researching the story of the Farallon was that these guys were shipwrecked and they'd survived for a month and were somehow rescued. But as I continued my research and found out more and more about the story, it was just incredible to me how little they had to work with how absolutely harsh the winter conditions they encountered were. A diary entry from one of those on board sums it up for Steve. 
The captain of the Farallon had never been to Iliamna Bay, and neither had the purser. And when two passengers presented themselves and asked for passage to that place, it was granted them without question. That is how we came to be bound for Iliamna Bay, the worst point on the run in January, the worst part of the year. Shipmasters who know the place shun it as they would the gates of Hades. The men on board were peering for the shoreline, looking for any landmark. They couldn't see the entrance to Iliamna Bay. There was a tiny dot on their chart marked Black Reef, but they thought they were well offshore. In reality, of course, they were steaming right down the middle of uh, a chain of volcanic rocks. It was high tide that morning. The tidal range in that area is between 20 and 30 feet. They thought they had plenty of water under them. As they were about to learn, though, even the high tides of Cook Inlet didn't leave them any margin of error. Seconds later, the Farallon hit a reef. It was 9.30 on January the 5th, 1910. The passengers and crew would be stranded here for nearly a month. Iliamna Bay is so incredibly remote. The weather and the other conditions so harsh that getting stuck there anytime would be bad enough. For these men, mostly sailors coming from the warmer climate of Seattle, ill-prepared for outdoor survival in the Alaska winter. It was just an appalling prospect. Everybody managed to get off of the Farallon safely, but the ship was stuck on the reef just out there, a quarter of a mile offshore, about where our boat is today. They salvaged what they could, put it in the lifeboats, and brought everything ashore just here. One of the first priorities was erecting some sort of a shelter. So they lashed together spare oars and boat hooks, erected a rough framework, and then spread one of the Farallon's auxiliary sails over this and made a shelter on the beach that they could all huddle into to get out of the storm. The snow was still falling. In fact, it had drifted six or eight feet deep in places, and the men struggled through this deep snow, trying to find firewood, sorting their provisions before they were covered by the falling snow. It's just a miserable experience for them. Amazingly, there was a photographer on board, Jack Thwaites, who took these photos as a documentary record of their ordeal. Jack Thwaites took photos of the men huddled around this tiny fire with the tins of melting snow, their shoulders dusted with snowflakes. The fire couldn't possibly have been giving them any heat. One of the key factors in their survival was that they remained calm and were able to salvage as much as possible from the vessel, which meant that they were quite well set up in terms of food supplies. The problem, though, was clothing. Now, this is August in Alaska. In January, the temperature drops to minus 40, and their situation was made worse by a cold wind blowing off of the mountain. Several of the passengers had come well prepared. Most of the sailors, though, were used to plying the waters of warmer Washington and Oregon, and they were in very bad straits so far as clothing or really outdoor experience of any kind. After the fire was going, the ship's cook sorted through the provisions and he found a case of hams, some potatoes. They boiled the hams, passed out pieces of bread. They all stood in line. The cook ladled a small piece of ham and a ladle of hot grease. As soon as the grease touched the bread, it turned into lard. It must have been a cold and miserable night for everybody. I've lived in Alaska all my life. I've seen the wind and the ice and the snow, but nothing that compares to what those men went through. The Farallon was just two weeks into a six-week voyage. It would be ages before it was missed. For people stranded in wilderness, there are basically two courses of action open. One is to stay with the vehicle or vessel that took you there and await rescue, usually the advised course, or the other is to throw lots of energy at trying to get out of the situation you find yourself in. The Farallon is quite an unusual story because both approaches were employed. By the next day, it became pretty clear that the ship wasn't going to float off the reef. They were either going to be found by a passing ship or they were going to have to go for rescue. 
Some of the men even suggested trying to walk for help, a trek that would have involved crossing more than 200 miles of desolate, uninhabited coastline, almost impossible to traverse. Others wanted to take a lifeboat. Those in favor of leaving in a boat included a Captain Weeding. We've brought his grandson, Dwight, back to the wreck of the Farallon for the first time. I know my grandfather was a, a man of action and really liked to get things done. Uh, he, he couldn't stand to sit around. So I'm sure that he was one who lobbied for the effort to go out and uh, uh, seek help. And I'm sure after a day or two of sitting around the camp here, he was ready to go, uh, regardless of the risks involved. They felt that their best chance was to try to row for Kodiak, more than 130 miles away. And if they reached that port, they had a good chance of getting word to another ship which could then come and rescue their comrades. They assembled all the provisions that they felt they'd need for the voyage. They had tins of lard and a box of ship's biscuits. They were well equipped with food and supplies. But what's just as important is that they knew exactly where they were going. This wasn't just a blind dash into the unknown. Most of the men who stayed behind felt that they were sailing to their deaths. But the men on board, I think, would, as seamen, would rather drown than starve. Once they'd evaluated their choices, made a decision, I get the feeling they were pretty confident in their choices. They were planning to row to the island of Augustine before heading south down the coast. Their ultimate goal was the larger settlements on Kodiak Island, the only place where they might find rescue. But as they set off on the morning of January the 7th, they couldn't have had any idea of what lay ahead of them. The men in the Farrell and lifeboat were lucky at first. The weather was pretty good, the seas were calm, and as darkness fell at the end of their first day, they reached shelter on the shore of Mount Augustine. The first night they spent in the boat, so they spread a piece of tarp over the boat posted a lookout that was changed every few hours. And they huddled together in the bottom of the boat, trying to generate whatever warmth they could. At first light on the next day, they set off again. They were trying to reach Miner's Point, but the farther south they went, the more ice they ran into. It was snowing a little bit. Seas were getting a little rough. Finally, in the afternoon, as it started getting dark, they reached Miner's Point. They tried to pull the boat up ashore out of the reach of the surf, but as they were doing that, it came down hard on a block of ice and put a hole through the boat. They knew they needed the boat and did everything they could to save it. So they pulled the boat as far up as they could. They couldn't get at their provisions. They were frozen in place under salt spray. So they lay down on the beach, fully exposed to all the elements, huddled under their same piece of sailcloth trying to pass the night without freezing. The storm was to trap them for over a month. At the camp, conditions were no better. They had no means of communicating with the outside world, no way of radioing for help. Basically, they just had to sit there hoping that someone would find them. The captain sent a boat out to the Farallon with instructions to bring back all of the doors from the cabins. These were hauled ashore and they stood them up, nailed them together and rigged a roof out of a piece of tarp, and they called that the cookhouse. They moved their fire in there, worked a lot better, and even gave them a cramped, smoky, but warmer place to enjoy their meals. In a desperate effort to beat the cold, they tore up sacks and pillowcases to tie over boots and create makeshift gloves. When nighttime fell and everybody decided it was time for bed, one at a time the men would go up close to the stove and try to get their clothes warm. Then they'd duck through the flap into the tent and unroll their mattress and make their bed. The men would get into bed fully clothed. They needed all the protection they could get, but even then it was freezing cold and they'd lie there shivering for 20 minutes before they could finally get warm enough to fall asleep. Day after day, the blizzard pounded them, trapping them in their tents. The men would leave the tents when they could. They'd go out and gather a little firewood or trudge through the snow to a drift and get some drinking water. Some of the men every morning would make their way to the rocks, hoping for a 
rescue ship. Then the storm would close in again, back into the tents, seemingly endless cycle of night and day and storm and wind. The morale must just have plummeted. The storm finally let up 12 days later. They decided to take a trip out to the Farallon for more supplies. The name Farallon is Spanish for a rock or cliff in the sea. And when they got out to her, they found that's just what she'd become, a white shrouded rock jutting out of the water. With the break in the storm, while they had an opportunity, most of the men made their way up to the hillside and cut masses of firewood and brought it back and stacked it by the cookhouse. They were determined that if the storm closed in on them again, they'd at least have enough firewood to keep the cook fire burning. The Farallon men spotted the Victoria long before they were seen, started waving shirts and stoking up their fire, trying to attract attention. The Victoria turned around. They were afraid that she hadn't seen them and was going to leave without them. Finally, the lookout on board the Victoria spotted a tiny glimmer of black against the all-white background. What it had seen was just a small piece of the Farallon's smokestack, the only thing on the whole ship that wasn't covered with ice, but it was enough. After almost a month stranded, the men of the Farallon finally had been rescued. But those who'd set out in the lifeboat were still weeks away from rescue. My grandfather was from a northern part of Norway, north of the Arctic Circle, actually. So to him, I'm sure it wasn't as severe as it seems to me. But uh, the, the conditions to me seem uh, more than I, I would be able to handle. When the weather finally let up, the men from the lifeboat decided that they could walk south. They knew there were settlements along the coast. They had no idea what to expect. They covered about 25 miles on foot. Finally, the men reached a native village, and there was a small, half-rotted dory. They negotiated with the man that owned it, and they gave him $50 and a gold ring, all they had between the six of them. Most of the men wanted to keep going. The tiny settlements down the coast barely had food for themselves and offered no prospect of help or rescue. One of the men had had enough. He took a look at that boat and looked at the stretch of ocean that they were expecting to negotiate, and he figured he was better off taking his chances on land. His name was Charles Byrne. Ironically, the boat was headed almost to where he lived, but he wasn't going to chance it. He was going to stay on shore. So five of them set out across Shelikov Strait. Their plan was to row to Kodiak, the nearest place to offer any chance of rescue, with large settlements that were on the shipping routes. Shelikov Strait is dangerous and unpredictable water. Fishing boats even today go down. Some are lost without a trace. Just being outside in those kind of conditions with modern clothing, scary enough for those men with almost nothing. I can hardly imagine. They reached Kodiak, but once more their boat was to be destroyed on the rocks. Must have been exhausted, cold, hadn't eaten a decent meal in weeks. But they'd come this far, and they were closer than they'd been to rescue so far. So they set off on foot. 20 hours they hiked. Finally, they reached a village and were able to find another boat. This their third boat since they'd left the Fairline camp. They rowed on, hoping against hope. They were still buffeted, exhausted, rowing against the currents. At last, they spotted their salvation. Just one light in a window, we're told, and they rode toward this light in the twilight of darkness and were probably met with surprise and alarm by this poor guy left for the winter by himself at the cannery. He fed him a good meal and put him to bed. They'd rowed 45 miles in 15 hours and had finally reached somewhere large enough to warrant regular visits by large boats. On the 7th of March, 50 days after the wreck of the Farallon, they were rescued. 
The story of the Farallon is an extraordinary tale in so many ways. I think one of the most amazing things about this story is that my dad was born the day my grandfather left to get help in the lifeboat, struck out on the open sea. It must have been an incredible thing to my grandfather when he uh, was rescued and found out that he had a new son. Ten days later, Charles Byrne, the last person missing from the Farallon, was finally rescued. It's incredible to me that these men had the resources and probably even more important, the mental fortitude to survive those type of conditions. Having been there and seen the wreckage of the Farallon and stood in the spot where the men had pitched their tents and seen the small bay where the lifeboat had rowed out to sea. It's just an incredible story of survival and quite a piece of history. Bathed in this late summer sunlight, it's hard to imagine how severe the Alaskan winter is, but this time of year is one of my favorite times to be in the woods. This plant here with the large leaves that's filling the forest here so effectively is Devil's Club. It's a member of the ginseng family and amongst the native inhabitants of this coastline, this was the number one cure-all. Mind you, it can cause a few problems too. It's well armoured with thorns up and down the stem and the underside of the leaves. And if you brush against that, it can cause a nasty rash. So you have to take care when working with this plant. The wood's good for carving too, and that's what I'm going to use it for. I'm carving something that the native people in this part of the world used to use. What I'm making is a fishing lure. It comprises four pieces of wood. This head carved to look like a wolf to imbue the lure with supernatural powers. And then three veins, which I'm going to lash on using a spruce root. There we go, all finished. Now, these were used by pushing them down into deep water using a long stick. Once down there, the stick was removed and these would turn around and then come to the surface like that, spinning up to the surface, attracting cod, following them up towards the surface. And as they came within visibility, the cod was speared. Quite an ingenious means of catching fish. Native skills are passed down from generation to generation, and I met up with Lillian Elsass of the Alutic people for a spot of beachcombing. We don't go out just for one thing. Whatever we find, we gather, we bring home. One of the favorite resources is chitons, which we call badarkis or gumboots or ochiducks. They have a chewy flavor to them. It's a lot of people call them shoe leather, but if you cook them the right way, they're delicious. I'm going to take and wrap these badarkis in this kelp here and put them over the fire and cook them. And hopefully the juices in, in the badarkis and in this kelp will cook here a while. We learned this from our elders and our elders learned from our ancestors, which has been over 10,000 years ago, and it's something that we pass on to our children, which is very important to our, our uh, native lifestyle. You can tell if it's, it's cooking by the change of color, and it gets a lighter color. Yes. Yeah, this is ready. This is ready. There's quite a bit of meat there. Let's try that. Whoa. Okay, what you do is you turn it over and you take all the shells off. 
peel them off this way. Oof. And that's another thing that we don't waste. Yeah. Or we take the um, butterfly sh shaped shells and we make jewelry out of them. We make earrings, necklaces, or we um, use them to decorate flower pots or vases or whatever. You ever taste yep. chitin before? I have. Oh. I've never had one like this one before. This is all leathery. The ones I've had have been harder shelled than this. Mmm. <laughs> Very good. It's got just enough salt flavor in there that you can eat about six of these and you'll be happier than the climate minus tide. <laughs> Hmm. That's lovely. That's really nice. I put it above limpet, but not quite as good as mussel. In winter, there's no question of finding supplies. You have to carry everything you need with you. In January 2000, Rod Boyce, a journalist, was competing in a dog sled race, so he was traveling light, as light as possible, in fact. When he lost his way, he had barely enough survival equipment to see him through. He quickly realized he had taken the wrong path and turned around, but he was unable to retrace his steps and was soon completely lost. When things go wrong out here, they have a habit of spiraling out of control. Rod was stranded in the middle of winter with supplies to last no more than a day. Rod had no idea where he was. He tied his dogs up and poured out a watery broth for them. He knew he might be stuck for days, but he'd only brought enough food for a snack. Even his sleeping bag was inadequate, not designed for the extreme temperatures he would face that night. As a journalist, he had read countless survival stories. This gave him a sketchy second-hand knowledge of survival. He knew water was vital and knew to melt snow rather than eat it. The wood was difficult to light, but ingeniously, a coating of husky foot ointment got the fire going. He could hear snowmobiles and search helicopters, and he tried to make himself seen, but his help sign was just too small. Days passed with no sign of rescue, but his dogs helped to keep him occupied so important in the psychology of survival. Two of them even slept on his bag at night to help him keep warm. At first he was careless, leaving vital equipment lying around, but he learned his lesson when a heavy snowfall buried everything, and he was lucky to find most of it again. When he looked at the snow he'd heaved aside, he realized he'd fashioned a rough shelter some branches and his sleeping bag soon improved it. Day after day, he searched his surroundings trying to find the snowmobiles that he could hear, but there was no sign of them and his meager supplies were fast running out. Then, after six days, while making one last search, he finally saw the snowmobiles in the distance. Sure that he could reach them, he went for broke. and was finally rescued. Thanks to a basic knowledge of survival, Rod and his dogs had survived six days exposed to the Alaskan winter. It's one more tale of survival to add to the countless stories down the years, and I'm sure there'll be many more from what is, after all, one of the last great wildernesses.